So we, we, we try to quickly get over that. And we try to talk about, and this gets into the digital transformation, we try to talk about how to create and craft that user experience at every customer touch point. And that's not just type. That happens to be our area of expertise, but everywhere. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. Guys, I'm really excited to share with you our latest sponsor, Yellow Images. There are a ton of places on the web right now to find ready to use solutions, but let me tell you why I'm excited to be the first to introduce you to Yellow Images. It's the number one marketplace with more than 40,000 premium mockups, fonts, 360 images, and a ton of other graphic assets to really make your job easier. Not to mention all those textures, patterns, presets, and UX UI kits. But there are really two things that I'm most excited about. Number one are their mockups. You know how some clients are like, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, Yellow Images has mockups that are high resolution with great lighting and shadows that will really help you sell your latest design or brand pitch by helping your clients see what it's going to look like. And number two is Yellow isn't just here to provide you with amazing assets, they wanna help you out too. So if you're seeking to create some passive income, become an author, put your work up for sale at Yellow Images and start getting paid for your own mockups, 360 images and fonts. Lastly, like any good podcast sponsor, Yellow Images has come through with a great offer. If you sign up today, they have a limited number of discounts just for our listeners. Head over to yellowimages.com and be sure to enter promo code obsessed at checkout. That's yellowimages.com and use promo code obsessed at checkout. Show them some love. I think you're going to dig what they're up to. Now, back to the show. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we're talking with Brett Zucker, CMO at Monotype. When most of you think of Monotype, especially you graphic designers and branding types, you will think design. And interestingly enough, Brett does not have a background in designer marketing that got him to the table here, but he's no stranger to the digital world, cutting his teeth at agency.com and nearly 14 years at Bridgeline Digital. Brett and I got a chance to know one another a little better last year through the first ever Type Champions Award by Monotype. And I finally got the chance to meet Brett in person at Adobe Max last fall in Los Angeles. Today we're going to be chatting with Brett about Monotype, accelerated digital transformation, and whatever else is on the plate for today. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Brett Zucker. Okay, kids, from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, I'm chatting with Brett Zucker. Brett, welcome to Obsessed Show. Uh, thanks, Josh. Great to be here. Hey, at the time of recording, you know, these are always a couple of months behind, but just to kind of level set from where we're at, um, it's June 2020, the best <laughs> year ever. No, actually. <laughs> Is it June 2020? I, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> it's such a mess. So we're in the midst of COVID. We're in the midst of all the social unrest, just two of the low lights of 2020 so far. How are you doing right now? I'm doing all right. You know, uh, I, I certainly can't complain. I'm adjusting to what seems to be uh, a n the normal for at least a, a while, certainly. I'm at home with the kids, dealing with all those kinds of things, uh, working over Zoom. So probably pretty, pretty uh, standard here. Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, that you had posed to me before we got on the call here and something that I feel like I'm talking with a lot of people about right now is this idea of brand authenticity. Um, you know, knowing what to say, when to say it, how to be yourself, how to express what you're thinking. Um, do you have any advice for us on this front? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um so it, it's it's really interesting right now what's happening. We started with COVID and and all that kind of. Um, you saw some folks who were sort of trying to take advantage of of the situation, and and then all of a sudden now the social unrest and the things that are going on there, which is which is crazy. Um, but uh, you know, from a brand's perspective, it, it it goes back to you know I always think of when COVID hit, it's go back to your core, go back mm -hmm. to who you are, go back to the people, you know, go back to what you believe in, go back to, you know, all of those things that make you tick. Um, and I think it's the same for the brand too, right? Look, look deep into who you are, what your DNA is, how you like to express yourself. 
um, your authentic self. Uh, because if you don't, we all know, I mean, that's not, not anything new. We all know that you end up, uh, coming across as either opportunistic or insincere or, or, you know, just not authentic, which, uh, people today will, will smell out in, in two seconds. Yeah. It's tough to know. Like, um, I just had a friend of mine pointing out that a former client had kind of stepped in it a little bit on social media today, you know, nothing awful, just that I think it came out wrong and they were getting some flack for it. Um, you know, how do you weigh that risk versus staying silent and saying nothing, you know, yeah. what, what are kind of the, the downsides there? So, um, so everyone's got a voice, right. And everyone has something to say and everyone can contribute. So even if you think about it, as a company and, um, as a person, so yeah, I don't think staying silent is, uh, is a good idea either, right. Because people are looking to either you as a person, um, everyone's a leader to somebody, right. Uh, or as an organization, you know, depending on, on the size of the organization or the influence you might have in an industry, I mean, people are always looking. So silence to me doesn't, it isn't, isn't good. Um, you know, what you say has to be sincere. So, I, I mean, I can use monotype as an, as an example. Um, you know, it, if we start talking about social unrest and, and those kinds of things, like we're, we're not experts, you know, we pride ourselves on including and caring for all and, and trying to live good lives and be good people and, sure. and all of that. So how, how do we participate? Right. And we, we've run some campaigns around, you know, keep giving the opportunity for people to express themselves through our IP and fonts and things like that. Um, and it's a way we can contribute that is authentic, that is not, it's not coming from us. It has nothing to do with revenue. It has nothing to do with the day. It's just giving people an outlet to express themselves uh, authentically and, um, you know, doing so in, in, a, in a way that is altruistic. Yeah. I think that's the best thing is just, you know, say what you believe. Well, I, I think that's great advice. Um, and I, I want to dig in a little bit more to, to monotype and I kind of teased this a little bit in the intro of the show, but, um, you know, you're at this intersection of design and technology and typography mm -hmm. and, and, but your background is not design or marketing necessarily, even as the CMO of yeah. monotype, which is a really interesting combination. So, uh, I'm sure our listeners are really curious. How do you get to be the CMO of monotype without a background in design or marketing or to put that differently, tell us about your origin story. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, that is true. I do not have a typical, um, a typical background. I started out, you know, even as a kid, right. You're always interested in taking things apart and seeing how things work. And, and so I went and, and got trained, you know, my background is actually engineering. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I just love to tinker and code and do all those kinds of things until I decided, wait a second, this is, I, I don't want to make a living doing this. <laughs> like, this is fun for me, but I can't make a living. But what I realized at the time, it was interesting is, um, you know, it, it goes back to, it wasn't necessarily how things worked, you know, the engineering part of it, which is definitely interesting to me, but it was more the experience I had with whatever I was working with. And it was more about the user experience. And so I started to learn. So not to date myself, but this was a while ago, right? Um, before, certainly before the internet, actually, just as email was even starting. Um, and I, I really started to learn about this notion of user experience. Mm. And, um, and that's kind of how I got started into um, the whole human computer factors and information architecture and, and you know, the the internet was just starting to, to get underway. And all of a sudden it's like, Hey, there's some really interesting things happening here. How does this start to change the way people interact with computers or right. It started to become very user centric for me. Um, along the way, I mean, you get, you get the background, but I've met some incredible designers and had the pleasure to work with uh, some amazing creative folks. And they taught me everything, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I'm not a graphic designer <laughs> at all. Um, but they taught me all the things about a, a alignment and kerning and, you know, and composition and all of these just basic concepts. And they're like, everything is built off of this. And all of a sudden, like a whole new world was open for me. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting. And, and uh, so fast forward is I, I started to get more into the user 
experience side of things, um, the creative side, working with a lot of creatives. And, and I really do appreciate that, that design approach, um, which led to uh, really thinking about product and product management. And, um, and then I got this opportunity at Monotype, which is fantastic and started in product and really got excited and passionate, you know, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners sponsor a religion. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and all of a sudden I got really passionate about this. I'm like, I want to tell the world, right. You start to learn more and more. And I, it just became a natural thing to go out there and start talking about it. Um, and so, you know, fast forward and, and there you go. That's how I ended up where I am. So, um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are curious, like, tell us a little bit about how monotype is, is shaped. What size of team is this? And, you know, how do you guys work together? Is there, are there lots of offices? Is everybody in Boston? How's that, how's that work? Yeah. Well, everyone's kind of home right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe now's but, a bad time to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, it's, uh, um, you know, we kind of go where the customers are. So we've got global offices, you know, Boston or just outside of Boston is, is our headquarters here in Woburn. Um, and then we have offices in London and, and, uh, in Germany, in Berlin, uh, Tokyo, Shanghai, right. Very much creative and, and customer epicenters. Um, and, uh, you know, as you, you started and alluded to at the beginning, right. we we are at the intersection of, of type technology and, and expertise. We have, mm-hmm. You know, I would call them the, the greatest collection of humans ever focused on typography, like their design capabilities, their just understanding of everything, going through this whole digital transformation and being able to translate something that was in a physical world into this digital world and how mm-hmm. to do that. Um, so it's just an, an amazing group. So we've got designers, we've got um, developers, we've got software engineers. Um, so it's a, it's a good group and a good mix of folks. And how many people are employed across the company? Uh, so it's probably about 600 across the globe. So I don't think people realize it's one of the first things, right? When you get yeah. into this business, first off, when you, you meet somebody, wow, that's really cool. Wait, Helvetica? That, that's you guys? <laughs> I, I didn't even know Fonts was a business. Right? Then, then you, you actually get to, wait a second, how big is Monotype? <laughs> yeah, how many people? How much in revenue? Right. All of a sudden, um, there's a great, actually, there was a great, I think it was CNBC a couple of years ago. Um, so we actually just went private about six months ago or, mm. or seven months ago. And, uh, so when we were public, there was, there was an analyst on CNBC and, and they were talking on the show and the guy goes, wait, stop for a second. That's what you're, you're telling me somebody owns the alphabet. That's like telling me somebody owns the color blue. Like, I don't understand. What do you, what do you mean? There's a, there's a business out there that has aggregated all, all the fonts that we use every day and all the brands, everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's us. And now we'll blow your mind and introduce you to Pantone who does own the color blue. Right. <laughs> absolutely. hundred percent. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> so, we um, had a bunch of those guys. They're, they're good. Maybe um, for our listeners who aren't familiar with it, um, tell us a little bit about the Type Champions Award that Monotype created. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this was um, last year. So one of the things that we do, and I'm not sure people also realize, is um, so I think, you know, yes, we are a very large and the, the largest foundry in the world from a, a type design and, and IP collection perspective, but we're also the largest distributor. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, we've got thousands of people, everyone from, you know, individual creatives who just had fun and made a font and resell it. So think the Amazon marketplace at my fonts. And, um, and so, you know, in the spirit of, you know, bringing typography to the brand and elevating the value of typography in the brand, we created what are called the type champion awards. Um, and we've got a whole panel of experts, um, and thank you (laughs) for uh, for participating in that. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, from all the the top agencies and all the top creative influencers and all of these folks just to celebrate typography in the brand. And it had nothing to do with any individual font or anything like that. Um, we created these awards for the industry, um, just to celebrate the art form. I mean, there's not a company in the world that cares more about fonts and, and typography than we do. And, uh, and we want to celebrate. Yeah. It was pretty awesome to be part of that and to 
you know, even just be in the virtual room with, with the other folks on the call. Um, and we'll, we'll have to, to link to all of that in the show notes. So you guys can, can check that out over at obsessedshow.com, but we'll link back to, to everything from last year is, do you guys see that being an annual program at this point? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about, you know, is this, this notion of creative matters and, and it's, you know, so it is so important right now, especially right. Like uh, we have, I think from a creative perspective, you know, a, somewhat of a social responsibility to, to, you know, bring messages and bring our voices, whether that's individuals or brands, we do that in, in creative ways. Um, and the type champions type champion awards is, is just a piece of that. Right. Uh, and so we are thinking about how to, create this umbrella again through industry participation as a collective unit, right? Get, get the, you know, the, the folks from all the biggest names in Adobe and Shutterstock and, you know, Getty and the agencies and Interbrand and Collins and all of these folks that were participating in the type champion awards too. And how do we elevate this to the creative industry as a whole? Again, just bring collective wisdom, um, around this notion of creative matters. And of course, for us, type matters as, as a key pillar of a brand and as a key element of creative, but it's, it's really in service of, of the entire creative industry. And so type champion awards will certainly be part of that. Yeah. Awesome. It was just a really, really great program and excited to share that with our listeners as well. So guys, be sure to check that out in the show notes. Um, you know, yeah, something... well, I'll ask you, can I, can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. There? <laughs> just on if the, i don't on like it i'll just cut it out because i'm also go. the chief editor of obsessed <laughs> show so <laughs> no i think um you know I'm, I'm curious on on your take on the type champions work type champion awards right because it's it's not about us um and as you know i know you're a judge and participating on the panel but i'm curious if there's sort of a uh, feedback or or how you took it and and whether we should be doing it every year or yeah. Is that a fair question? Yeah, totally. I, I think it is a great thing to to look at every year. Um, and I, I think one of the places where we felt kind of a charge and, and a, it was, you know, difficulty, a bit of a challenge was making sure that we were looking enough places, you know, are we, are we right. looking internationally enough? So I know we had a few, uh, that we recognized that were international companies, but you know, it's, uh, you know, to cast an even wider net next year, I think would be the, the chief encouragement that I would have. Um, yep. and, and we felt a lot of pressure to do that. So <laughs> I'm going to lump more pressure on the next round of guys that <laughs> have yeah, to figure yeah. this out. No, no, you'll be back. You'll be back again. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I think well, that's then I just put that on myself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I saw your hand raised too. Yeah, I, I think I did. Um, no, but that's an interesting point, right? Like, especially given what's going on in the, the social sphere right now and, and some of the upheaval, right? Having that international voice, um, you know, you, you think about like the Latin type is used everywhere and all around the world, but mm -hmm. the majority of, of the world sits outside of... English as first, right? Right. And, um, and so, you know, making sure that we are thinking globally, I think is a really important concept. It's good. Yeah. I had the chance to, um, speak at a little marketing conference in Oman last fall. It oh, was wow. like right after I was in LA, uh, actually it was right before I was in LA and it was cool to see, um, like packaging that I knew. So to see the, the, the tide on the shelf in the grocery store and then to see the Arabic version of it and see the things that the designer did to connect the things of the type form. So even not just the color, but even the way the, the serifs kind of played off of one another was like, I never even thought of that little element, but the, yeah. the non-Latin characters, like that whole world is, is really interesting to me. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and again, you know, I might not think about it until you sort of get into this world, but you know, from, from your audience perspective, uh, the designers, it's, uh, it, it's somewhat second nature, right? You're working for these global brands and, and you can walk into any, any store and, and just start picking out 
whether you can read the language and the words or not, you know exactly what that is, which is just amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It was really cool too. Cause I was, I was there with some other marketing folks. So when we were on that last day, when we had time to just run next door and grab some snacks, it was like, Oh, look at the signage and look at the packaging and look at the, <laughs> look at how they do printing and look at how the display, like, I mean, this has nothing to do with design per se, but like, um, seasonings and, and, uh, like nuts and seeds, like everything's just out in yeah. a little pile. So you have to go scoop it instead of buying cool. a little thing of cumin or whatever, like you yeah, go yeah. scoop it out and put it in your own container. And like just that whole experience I thought was really cool. And where you might think like, well, that seems weird that it's just all out, but that also made it feel like higher end, more boutique that, that you kind of go collect your own stuff. So yeah, it's a that. really cool experience. Yeah, totally. And that's exactly the, you know, when I talk about the user experience and, and so when you walk into a location, doesn't matter geography, right? Take some of these different lenses away, whether it's geo or, or, you know, um, it's absolutely a brand experience. And so, you know, when you walk in and the shape of the bottle, the color, right, you, you feel there's, you understand that's tied or that's whatever, or you mm -hmm. walk into McDonald's into any individual, you know, location or around the world, like that's the experience for good or for bad, but you know, it's, that's the experience, right? <laughs> the thing that amazed me was, you know, it, it wasn't surprising to see a McDonald's uh, or to see Starbucks or to see, you know, tied in the grocery store, but they had a five guys in the, oh, in really? the mall next door. I was like, wow, that brand has made it this far that there's wow. a five guys in Oman. Just kind of amazing. That's cool. was, was it in Latin type or was it? It was, yeah. Yeah. It was in the, just the regular, the and I think they probably had something underneath yeah, yeah. Um, in Arabic, but, um, it was still the main brand was still the, the typical logo. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, well sort of on the same lines of that, I'm, I know you're really passionate about the, the digital transformation topic. Um, yeah. how, how have you seen this unfolding at monotype or how is, how is your lens looking at this differently? Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I am definitely passionate about this. It's, uh, and there was a McKinsey article, which I thought summed it up so perfectly. It was, you know, we, we have fast forwarded five years in the last eight weeks. And, I, and just like that simple phrase, yes, that just nails it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, in some cases that's good. Some cases that, that may not be so good. Right. Um, but you start to think about retail, right? We're physical locations. And all of a sudden, you know, most major retailers had an online experience already. Um, but you can see that even a lot of local restaurants and small businesses, which generate a huge portion of, of the, the economy, um, maybe didn't or didn't have a complete experience. And all of a sudden, they're, they're you know, launched into this world that they just weren't necessarily prepared for. And if you think about like over the next five years, they would have had to do that anyway. And, if, you know, it's these folks who, who are able to make that leap and, and bring that experience into the online world that are going to be most successful. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely interesting to start to see how people are changing, uh, you know, their online experience. Do they start with going digital first and, and did they have that mindset or did this actually catch them by surprise? Like there's a great, um, I forgot who, where the article was, but it was Best Buy. Mm -hmm. right here in the States. And, and, um, and so obviously they always had an online presence. They always had a, uh, an app. They always had, you know, the website where you could buy and pick up online or buy online, pick up in store. They had all of these things, but now all of a sudden with COVID, all that changes, right? You yeah. can't buy online and necessarily pick up in the store. <laughs> right. And, and now all of a sudden it's like, Hey, this is the place that people are going to first to shop. They're not necessarily, you know, walking and browsing the aisles and other things. Um, and there was a really great article about Best Buy in particular that, I, that caught my attention where they said they started to distribute all of the uh, responsibility down to the, to the local stores in how to deal with curbside pickup. Mm -hmm. But they all, you know, they all live the same Best Buy values and Best Buy brand and, and voice and all of those kinds of things. And, um, and so they were empowered to do it and they were armed with all the brand elements. And I don't mean necessarily, you know, the visual elements of here's the sign, yeah, right. but it's just how we treat our customers, how we think about this. 
um, how we actually technically are going to implement this. Um, what some people actually had, uh, you know, sort of these pop-up tents and some actually used the mobile areas where there, you used to be able to get car, you know, where you get your cars, mm -hmm. radios and stuff where they kind of made those the garage and a drive by garage. And, and some had set up, you know, in the parking lot or whatever worked for them. And I thought it was just an amazing sort of transformation that was really well done, um, from a customer's perspective. And so that was, that was definitely interesting to me. Yeah, where some of this was made real over the weekend, um, I got to watch my girlfriend's dad working Zoom and, you know, <laughs> his audio wasn't right. And he, he's in his 80s and he troubleshot the, the audio and figured it out himself. And I was really? thinking like, imagine six months ago, like, would that scenario have still played out as efficiently, as effectively that an 80 year old using Zoom would be able to troubleshoot the audio and get it all figured That's out? Great. Like, just just boom, like he had to make that change, you know, to learn and be savvy and quick. And, you know, maybe he was always like that, but that was, that was my first impression of him. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is awesome. I mean, I wish, uh, I probably shouldn't say this out loud or on a public forum, but you know, we had some of those family zooms and mm -hmm. uh, it didn't always work out, you know, the camera's facing the wrong way with your <laughs> grandmother and like, you know, the thumbs over the camera or, you know, like half your, it's upside down. It's just, I think everyone probably has some of those stories. Yeah. There's probably plenty of people in professional settings that <laughs> doing the same <laughs> thing. There's some great Saturday night live skits. <laughs> um, uh, but actually zoom is really an interesting one too, because, you know, we started to think about how, how you stay connected with members of your team and, and other things. And, and so one of the things that we've done, we've seen a lot of, of folks do is, you know, the zoom backgrounds, right? How do you keep a sense of team, a sense of camaraderie, sense of mm -hmm. purpose? Um, you know, and, and it revolves around the brand, the brand promise and all of those things. And so it's, it could be as simple as the background of your, your zoom. Um, and so we've seen a lot of companies start to really do that to make people feel connected, right? We all work for company X and brand X and here's our mission. This is what we do. And it's reminded you know, it's a way to stay connected. Yeah. My, so my day job, I'm also a CMO for a membership organization. And we know that most membership organizations, they're members for the, the education, the things are going to learn that, you know, professional development stuff. And it's for the network. And it's in, in this uh, time, the network is really hard to pull off uh, virtually. So I'm curious yeah. in your CMO role, um, what big changes you've seen and where, where you have bigger challenges or maybe different goals than you would have had before, before COVID and before of all, all of this going on. Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, we actually just took a survey of all the employees and, and talked about sort of this work from home and, and continuing that and how mm -hmm. to deal with it. And it was interesting because, wasn't a hundred percent. It certainly was pretty close. Like where people said, Hey, I can continue and I can do this from home. Um, and felt very confident and comfortable with that. So it might, maybe we're an anomaly, um, you know, in the way that we work, but we are primarily a digital company, uh, which sort of naturally lends itself to, to operating in a digital environment. Um, that being said, I also personally, I, I like, I, get energy from being around other people. And I certainly mm. have Zoom fatigue and, and, <laughs> right. um, but you know, we, we, we've made do, um, I don't think we've changed any of our sort of goals as a company or operations or anything like that. Um, one of the things that we did do though is, uh, and it goes back to something you, we were saying earlier. The first thing was the customer empathy Right. We didn't know what to do, yeah. but we just kind of went back to our core and, our, and, and said, okay, what do we do to help our customers? All the customers are, are working from home now too. They're in a different environment. What can we do to just help customers? Don't worry about the cost. Don't worry about the technology. Don't worry about the infrastructure. Don't worry about how we tell them or ways we get them signed up or whatever. What do they need? Um, and just sort of took stock. And so we probably spent the first 60 days as an organization, just doing that, right. Mm -hmm. saying, Hey, you know, you're going to go over on your web finds. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk to you in 60 days, like, and we'll yeah. figure this out or, you know, or 90 days or whatever it is. Don't worry about it. Or, you know, you have seats or access to certain things. 
Don't worry about it. Or because everyone's working from home, do you need more seats? Just use them. Like we, you take the blinders off and, or, or locks off or, or guards off. And, um, so it's kind of, those are the things that, that we started with and we didn't do everything perfectly, uh, for sure. But, um, you know, I, I can say that we, we, we certainly tried. <laughs> <laughs> so with a company like monotype, uh, this is maybe one of the few examples where you can really say like anybody can be your, your client, anybody can yeah. be your customer. Um, but I'm curious, especially with your CMO lens on, um, who's kind of an ideal user or who, who's kind of like your, um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here. Like who, who are you guys focused like on? Who are you really paying the most attention to? Yeah. So there's really, um, it's two sides for us in the way we think about it. When you think, you know, and in, in the creative world, there's always these opposing force actually probably ev everywhere, right? There's always these equal and opposite forces. Um, one is on the creative professional side, the people who design for a living and, and get paid for it, right? They need access to, there's never enough fonts, no matter how much, <laughs> it, it simply can't be enough, just, just insatiable appetite. Um, and how do you find them and, and all those kinds of things. Um, so it's, it's making sure that we are continually either innovating in terms of the inventory in the library or in the way you use and access and learn and, you know, pair and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then that's, so that's definitely one piece of the audience. The other is sort of, you know, on that, that sort of control side, are you licensed? Right. You know, you get some of the big companies and, and, you know, they want to make sure that they are properly licensed and we appreciate that. Right. Mm -hmm. These are art forms and people's livelihoods. Uh, and so you get folks, whether that's procurement or legal or it and, and, and then you even have marketing, the marketing groups so or the brand managers, e commerce who, who might be using it in market, whatever the creatives design, how do you put that into market and are you licensed properly? So those are sort of the people that we, in the ecosystem that we play in. Um, and then you think about agencies too, who are making decisions and doing production work and, uh, you know, creative comps and those kinds of things. And how do they get access? And so we call it the magic triangle. You've got the, the brand, the agency and, and monotype and mm -hmm. sort of how do we all work together? Sort of the ecosystem that we, we look at it. What's maybe the most surprising thing once people figure it out about monotype and, and how you go to market? Yeah. So the first thing it, it, it easily is, wait, I have to pay for fonts. <laughs> <laughs> that is easily the, the, uh, the number one question that, that, that we get. Um, you know, and the reality is, like I said, it's, it is an art form and, and an amazing one at that. And, uh, one of the most valuable from a brand recognition standpoint. And, and so the yeah, short answer is yes. Um, we like to think of it in the positive though, which is right. Think of all the brand recognition that you have because of the font IP. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's value to you. And, and from a brand perspective, the amount you would spend on a font is, uh, is minuscule compared to, you know, the amount you invest in, in the equity of your brand. So we, we, we try to quickly get over that and we try to talk about, and this gets into the digital transformation. We try to talk about how to create and craft that user experience at every customer touch point. And that's not just type that happens to be our area of expertise, but everywhere, right? How do you have, you know, the, your retail locations, your website, your app, your digital ads, right? How do all of these play together um, to craft that user experience or that customer experience? And so those are things that we like to educate our customers on. Um, you know, most are, are pretty tech savvy at this point. Um, but there's always things to look at, no matter what brand you look, you, you look at, there's always design and, and, and branding inconsistencies. So it keeps us busy at least. <laughs> I know this is probably like the, which is your favorite child question, but like, yeah. are there any initiatives that you guys have going on right now that you're most excited about or campaigns coming up or anything that just gets you really fired up? Yeah. So, um, so one that I was really excited, which was years in the making, was the launch of Helvetica Now, right? The, the basically yeah, the Helvetica. Face. Yeah, that was just amazing. And you start to think about um, all the different weights and, and everything for today's environment. And uh, 
And the passion that came out of the Monotype Studio for developing that and bringing it into the modern world was just, it was palpable. It was awesome. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The upcoming though. So what am I most excited about? Um, you know, I envision a world <laughs> where, you know, the, the, our monotype studio and all the type directors and type designers are sitting next to a creative in their time of need, right? Like mm-hmm. literally having that person sitting right next to you, providing advice on what font to use and how to pair and, and kerning and all of the things, right. That are time consuming for the creative. Uh, and so we have this notion of what we're trying to do in a mantra and a vision around getting rid of the A to Z drop down menu. So how do we eliminate that? It's in every Adobe application. It's in Word. It's in your browser and Google Docs and everywhere. It's the A to Z drop-down menu, which is terrible. Like there's no one will say, you know, no one's going to miss the A to Z drop-down menu, (laughs) right? So how do you start to help a designer as if they had somebody from the, the studio there working side by side with them. And so we have, um, we have a product that we're working on from an AI and machine learning perspective that actually can be context aware that can be, you know, understand brand standards that can understand which includes sort of the fonts and whatnot, um, how to pair what's the, what are the environments that this is going into? Right. What are the descriptors uh, of the brand and the personality of the brand? And how do you start to make recommendations or even things? um, uh, I know the designers who actually the graphic designers at Monotype, not the type designers, but them too. But uh, the graphic designers are so excited because, you know, as every designer spends ungodly amounts of time with kerning. Right. (laughs) So. How do we start to use machine learning to help with things for legibility and the environment based on the type, the the font that you've used and give you options and start to learn what your personal preference is with that? And not that we can get 100% of the way there, but imagine telling a designer that you have the ability to, you know, knock 25 to 50% of the time you spend kerning, knock it away, you know, just take it away, Mm -hmm. right? Like these are the things that get our you know, our blood going and get it, you know, get us excited. Are there any things that you guys have? Um, and maybe this AI thing is it, but, um, any big projects that you guys have out there in the future that you're just fired up to, to work on or like dream projects that you'd like to work on through monotype? Yeah. Yeah. So this one, getting rid of the A to Z is definitely not an easy thing. (laughs) Um, so, uh, so that's definitely, you can put that in the dream category, right? Cause th- there's different stages that, that this will have to take. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, it just hearing our studio talk about some of the, the type that is coming out and things like variable fonts and, and starting with those things first, mm-hmm. um, I think are some really interesting projects as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing variable fonts take off. We actually just had a company meeting this morning and, uh, and one of the, one of the team members spent, you know, a half hour talking about, you know, variable fonts and the value and the, and the responsive design nature. And, you know, with us reading more digitally online and the, you know, being able to, uh, it could be on your, your iPad or your iPhone or, you know, your, MacBook or whatever it is, right? And you're using handoff and you're reading things in different environments, but the, the actual creative is changing based on that. And not just responsive, but the creative and the layouts and the, and the legibility and the, all of these things start changing in those environments. So I think variable fonts definitely has a, has a good future. Well, um, this is an extra strange question for you, not coming from a design background, but now that you're surrounded by it, I'm curious if you've found um, any design heroes or maybe favorite, um, typefaces or font designers, you know, so you can, you can answer that a variety of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do. So every, everyone always asks what your favorite font is. 
Um, and it's, it, it is easy. It's Helvetica puts food on the table. It's an easy answer for <laughs> um, I love you know, Maybe that's not the best answer, but it is, it is, I think the right answer for me, at least. Um, it is, uh, it, it's a classic and, and certainly, uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, I mean, from the the design, with its own documentary has got to be pretty awesome. Right. right. <laughs> So uh, we, we used to have these conferences called Typo in Germany. And, um, and it was there that I saw the first time that they had Helvetica watches. Like, I mean, mm. it's just it's so ubiquitous. If you just said Helvetica, my parents know. Like, it just, mm. it's, it's right. amazing that something is so um, ingrained in culture and, and understood. You know, that's rare. You don't get to often work for, for a company or, or have, you know, a connection to that. Uh, from a creative perspective, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily a person and, uh, and I'm sure he won't mind me, you know, using his name or, or whatnot. Um, and you know him too, Brian Collins, right? Yeah, um, of course. Yeah. Uh, I have, it is the wackiest story. Not to, you can cut this out or, or go on it. You know, no, we're going to keep all the wacky stories in here. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I'm going to tell this story just cause it's Brian and, and probably anyone who knows him will believe this wholeheartedly and, and whatnot. So this was years ago and, uh, and we were at Adobe max. And so I'm at the monotype booth and I'm standing there and we're talking to customers and, and all of a sudden this guy comes in who I didn't know, like a tornado. <laughs> and for those, you know, right. He comes in and he, he starts talking to everybody and he's loud and but <laughs> incredibly charismatic and attention is being, you know, everyone's focusing attention on him. Like, who is this guy? And then, you know, somebody, I could see somebody kind of point over it at me. I guess I was kind of the most senior person mm-hmm. there. And, and he comes over and he, and, uh, and, and I won't use the language that he used <laughs> the family show. And he goes, <laughs> what the, F are you guys doing? And and I kind of, Hey, but he just said it in such a charming way (laughs) that I I just looked at him and I started laughing and I said, well, I'm not really sure, but I'm really intrigued to understand and learn what you think I'm doing. (laughs) And so, uh, there was a garbage can. So, you know, like the backdrops and and, uh, so there's a garbage can in front of uh, one of our product logos. And so we have this backdrop and, and you know, was, there's logos and things all over. Uh, and he's like, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I was like, well, you know, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't have a garbage can. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> and then, so I, I literally spent about 90 minutes with him right then and there. And, uh, and, and he sort of had me at hello kind of thing. And, um, and so I've gotten to know him over the years and, and his team, you know, he in himself, of course, is incredibly creative talent and just an amazing figure. But his team, if you look at the work that they do, um, it is just absolutely just amazing. And I know they, they won the ad age Aiden design agency of the year and, and rightfully so. Um, I, I don't think he would mind mentioning it's kind of like, if you look at, some of the work with Dropbox and MailChimp, and, right? Mm-hmm. Like all Twitch, right? All these brands that have really changed their mindsets and they've used their brand to change consumers' minds about them. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been pretty incredible. So Brian is definitely one who, uh, and for those of you that don't know him, you should, if you ever see him somewhere, just walk up and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been on the show, uh, two and a half times. So he had a little, oh, okay. a little great, cameo great. appearance on one of the, one of his employees episodes. So, <laughs> so fine. we'll definitely link to those, those episodes in the show notes as well. Yeah. I will say, you know what? I, I do have to put a shout out too, if, if it's okay for, um, yeah. for inner brand. Um, you know, my back with my background, right. And, and not coming purely from the design and, and having an MBA and, and thinking sort of the, the business aspects of it. Um, I have to say what Interbrand has done to sort of put a tangible value on brand mm-hmm. is so helpful for the industry. And, um, and so, you know, for that, I'm grateful. And I think, you know, most, I'm not sure 
I think it often gets missed. I, I know from a, a marketer's perspective, it, it's something that people look to and, and sort of read their, their materials and their thought leadership pieces. But I think from a creative perspective, maybe, maybe I'm off base here, but I think it's pro- it may be undervalued um, in just how they think about the value of the visual design of the brand. And which gives all everybody all in the creative world the latitude and the and the dollars, frankly, to actually go spend and, and work on the brand. Um, so I think uh, you know I'd, I'd throw a shout out to those guys too. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's another good mention. Um, you know, while we're on the design topic, uh, again, this doesn't have to be a design answer, but we've asked everybody who's ever been on the show before. Yeah, Brett, what do you think it is that you are most obsessed with right now? Most, but not, not a, can be anything you want. Oh, uh, uh, well, I, mean, I got Helvetic a funny, is a fine answer too. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a funny answer, which my wife and kids would, you know, in this quarantine, in the, in the spirit of teaching yourself life skills, I was never a coffee drinker, mm. but my wife was in all the stores, you know, Pete's and Starbucks and everything's closed. So I bought her one of those like, uh, latte machines, like a steams mm. the milk mm-hmm. and espresso machines and whatever. I, ha- I, I, you know, when this is all over, if this whole font thing doesn't work out, I'm totally becoming a barista. Like I, I, she, <laughs> you laugh, like, I can't even tell you how much I've spent on beans, but not to drink them, like to practice latte art and all these other things. Um, that is, I, I have been going crazy and they're, they'll walk downstairs, just shaking their head, the family and just look at me. <laughs> Is wrong. You get 10 cups lined up of practice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'll be sitting there watching videos, totally obsessed with, uh, I love the science of how it tastes and, mm-hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the fun, the fun answer from a, uh, you know, from a, a more business and, and practical standpoint, I think we are obsessed with this digital transformation. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about what the customer's experience will be as everybody gets to digital first, mm-hmm. right? It's, I mean, it's just where it's going. And, um, and we're certainly more than halfway there. And uh, so, you know, I, I definitely have a passion for that. And something, it's something I think about all the time is, is what is customer's experience going to be like three, five years from now? Um, and how, how do brands actually tap into that? Yeah, that's great. Well, Brett, before we wind down here, I'm curious if you have maybe either a favorite piece of advice that you've received or one of your favorite pieces of advice to pass along. Yeah. Um, so my favorite advice. So this is what comes to my head. Um, you know, and I tell everyone, it doesn't matter your discipline. And this kind of speaks to a little bit who I am, but, um, it doesn't matter your discipline. You could be a designer, you can be, um, you know, a salesperson, you can be, you know, uh, an assistant. It, it, it just really does not matter. I would highly encourage people to understand the business operations for where they work. Hmm. What is valuable to your customer? What is valuable to the company? Right and understand how how the company builds value for the customer. Um, it'll make you a hundred times better at your job if you understand that ex- value exchange between the, the company and the customer. Why do people choose you, and and all of those kinds of things. So spend time um, really understanding what it is that you sell, why people buy it. Even get into things around you know f- basic financial aspects of mm-hmm. it. Understand. You know, why do I get to spend $10 million? Why do I not get to spend $20 million? Right. Like, and it puts some really good context to decisions that are made and, and sort of helps you navigate and, and understand what's going on. Yeah. Especially if you're on the uh, marketing side of the equation where I'm guessing a lot of our listeners live, uh, yep. understanding how that company makes, how we make money. How do where where's the yeah, profit? Yeah. What what where do we make the most? And how do I how do I do it better? And it's a good way to make yourself very good friends with the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, show them the ROI calculation. You'll make friends with the C- CFO. <laughs> I put a dollar in, I get seven dollars out. Great. 
here's right. more dollars. <laughs> Great. You can now have two dollars. Yes, exactly. Um, well, hey, Brett, before we let you go, tell our um, listeners where we can track down more about you and learn more about Monotype. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, you can certainly find me on Twitter at, at brettzucker.com. All right. At Brett Zucker, sorry. Um, and then more, uh, a lot of our content is at monotype.com. Um, Instagram is a great resource for uh, at uh, by monotype. And then, of course, you know, the IP is always available at myfonts.com. Uh, it's, some, it's some great stuff up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we are. Awesome. Well, Brett, it's good uh, catching up with you here again and looking forward to the Type Champions Award for the coming year. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 144 in the books. This episode is brought to you by Yellow Images. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.